I believe we are created for greatness, not mediocrity. That we are to live our lives accordingly, striving to be agents of change as we attempt to leave this world a better place than we found. Edison and Einstein, Ford, the Rockefellers, and wrote now the 20th best-selling book in the history yes. of the world. They can grow. I with. got this. So here's what you don't know. See, Carnegie was a stickler for action, and he gave his guest only 60 seconds to make up his mind. When Napoleon Hill walked out of the office, Carnegie reached in his pocket, and there was 60 seconds left on his watch. But what people don't know is that Carnegie made that same offer to 250 men before Napoleon Hill. He was the only person ever to say yes. Everyone always looked at obstacles and challenges. They let their big butt stop them. You know what that means? I'd go do that. And that big butt kept them from getting to what they want. I call it a bad case of the one size. That means I'm gonna take action, one side, get the kids out of the house. One side, get the big break. And the best time you can take action is the moment that it strikes you. Yep. Well, that was in 1908. Fast forward 100 years to 2008. The president and family of the Napoleon Hill Foundation wrote that same letter like Carnegie wrote to Hill, and they gave it to me. And they gave me an opportunity to follow in this cat's footsteps. And they said, you know, things are kind of different in 2007, 2008. He goes, we can't relate to another billion dollar success story, but we can relate to Quitty. So he asked me to do this book called Three Feet from Gold. And the concept of Three Feet from Gold was about not giving up before the miracle happened. Stop, stop, stop. The story goes like this. There was a, there was a gold miner named R.U. Darby. He goes out west and he has gold fever. He digs a hole and finds a couple nuggets and gets excited. He buries it, goes home, and tells his family friends. They chip in money to buy it out by the ore cart, but then their gold ran out. They kept digging, but there's no more gold. Defeated, Darby walks out of the mine and says, I quit, I'm done, and sees a junk man walking by. He goes, hey, buddy, give me $200. I'll sell you this mine and all the equipment. The junk man realizing the equipment was worth thousands said, of course, you got a deal. Darby goes home defeated. But the junk man goes to an engineer and says, what happened? This guy hit gold and ran out. The engineer laughs. He goes, that's mining 101. Everyone knows that gold runs in a straight line. It's called a gold vein. What Darby did is he came in one side, hit the gold, and popped back into dirt. He goes, go back to where they discovered treasure. Go 90 degrees, three feet the opposite direction. You'll tap back into the vein. Not only did he pull millions upon millions of dollars out, but that's what fills Fort Knox today. And the moral is, how many times have we, or someone we know, quit one class short from a degree, or sales, or marketing, or marriage, or whatever story we tell ourselves. And it's the people that persevere and go the extra mile, they're the ones that we tell stories about down the line. The first person they asked me in an interview was a guy named Dave Lineker. He wanted to get into real estate back in 1970. I said, was it hard? He goes, oh my gosh. All my investor money ran out. I was broke. I had nothing. He said, for two years, every phone call that came in was from a bill collector. The third year, they threw me in jail, called me a fraud. I go, what'd you do? He says, I took my attitude from trying to prove them wrong to something more important and prove myself right. Mm -hmm. He said, I had the courage to pick up the phone. I called those bill collectors and said, I'll be honest, all the money is gone. I don't got 50 grand, but I got 50 bucks. I'll send it to you with a promise I won't quit. He says, don't give up on me. I won't give up on my dream. He says, I called every bill collector every month until the fourth year where someone believed in me and bought the first business called Remax Real Estate. He goes, you know, I'm nothing, but how many people's lives were changed because I wouldn't quit? How do we know that someone sitting in this room right now isn't about to give up on their own dream? because maybe Lisa was calling him upstairs.
From there, I got to sit down with the guy who's building the elevator to space to the gentleman who invented string theory, from the founders of NASCAR to Miss America and Mrs. Fields Cookies. And I found a common denominator. You know what they all had? They had stickability. They had the concept that they had of knowing in their heart of heart that they were onto something and never let another person or themselves talk them out of their dream to be true. Who here would have gone with me to meet all these people? Anyone? Yeah, yeah I, I, I hope so. Here's the fact. I invited over 350 people and only three ever showed up with me. I had a chance to meet all these people and no one showed up. And I realized most of success is simply putting your butt in the chair, right? And it had the opportunity to meet these people. That's how the secret knock came to be. Afterwards, it became a great success and they felt bad. I said, how do I get to meet your friends? And I says, I'll just put together an event. And imagine sitting down and having a chance to meet the guy who invented the credit card magnetic script and change banking, or the guy who created Ugg Boots, or the founder of the greatest organization of charitable contribution. What if you had a chance to go knees and knees with these people and just hang out with them? Well, that's what Secret Knock is all about. By the way, our next event's gonna be in August. It's real short coming up. We're 100% sold out, and we reserve tickets just for this event for anyone that wants to go. There's no other possible way to buy tickets, by the way. And what's really cool about this one, we've got the founders of Barefoot Wine to the guy who did Billy Bob Teeth. You ever see those fake crooked teeth that people put in their mouths? He went from living in a cave to a $40 million business. Know why? Because he had a dream and he was willing to go ahead and had the courage to succeed. And one of the people I met on the journey was Mr. Frank Shankowitz. And I asked him to come here tonight to share his story of how the Make-A-Wish Foundation came to be. Would anyone like to hear it? Yeah. Put your hands up, Mr. Frank Shankowitz. Thank you, my friend. Go ahead, man. Uh, I've got to kind of give you a condensed story tonight about how a seven-year-old boy changed the lives of over a million people in the last 33 years. And um, in 1980, I was motorcycle officer with the Arizona Highway Patrol. And the TV show during that time, Chips, was very popular with a lot of the young kids. Some people are shaking their heads, so I know how old you are. <laughs> But I was introduced to a little boy, seven years old, named Chris, who had leukemia, and we found out he only had a couple weeks to live. And Chris's heroes were Ponch and John from Chips. He kept telling his mother, when I grow up, I'm going to be a motorcycle highway patrol officer. And the family got a hold of our department and asked if there's something we could do for this little boy. If I could meet him, just let him see the motorcycle. This turned into a, a, such a big day in the history of the Arizona Highway Patrol where with the permission of his doctors, his mother, he was flown from his hospital to our headquarters building where I met him for the first time. I expected our paramedics to help out this very ill little boy. The door opened, here comes this pair of sneakers jumping and running, the seven-year-old, high five, hi, I'm Chris. I'm Officer Shanklitz, I can't say that. What's your first name? Frank, okay, Officer Frank. But this little boy, I, I expected to be very ill, but He's having this wish become true to meet a real motorcycle officer. Chris went on that day to receive uh, his smoky hat that we did, a badge that was assigned to him and still assigned to him today, a certificate making him the first and only honorary highway patrol officer in the history of the Arizona Highway Patrol, and this is 33 years ago. And Chris went home that night instead of back to the hospital. His doctor was with him, he said, I don't understand what's going on. This little boy is so pumped up that he doesn't, he can go to his comfort zone. He doesn't have to go back to IVs and everything else. Chris went home and we started thinking, we've got this new highway patrolman, but a highway patrolman needs a uniform. And in those days, uniforms are custom made. We go to a uniform shop just as we're closing. We say, we got this seven year old boy. He's about this high, that wide. Can you make a uniform for him? Two ladies spent all night making a new custom uniform for Chris. <laughs> The next day, and with the permission of our commanders, obviously, I led several motorcycles, patrol cars into Chris's neighborhood, red lights and siren. You can imagine the neighbors, right? <laughs> What's going on with this family? And Chris came running out, just ecstatic. Here's all his heroes. And we handed him his uniform. This little boy is just smiling as can be. He runs in the house, comes out just beaming. He's got a smoky hat on, full uniform. But he comes over to me and he says, I want to be a motorcycle officer. How do I do that? 
and just teasing them, I explained the training we went through. In fact, we trained with California Highway Patrol initially up in Sacramento. Explain everything we do and said, it's a shame you don't have a motorcycle, Chris. We'd set up pylons and test you right now. Chris was a step ahead of me. He runs in the house and comes riding out on a little battery operated motorcycle that his mother got for him in place of a wheelchair. So we set up traffic cones. He goes through the cones. Did I pass? Yes, you did, Chris. Am I a motorcycle officer? Yes, you are, Chris. When do I get my wings? Well, Chris, those are special made. I'm going to order this for you right away. Chris, again, got to stay home that night. The next day, as I pick up the wings, I get a call. Chris is in the hospital in a coma. He's probably not going to survive the day. I go to the hospital. His uniform is hanging right by his bed. Just as I pin down those motorcycle wings, he comes out of the coma. He looks at me. He just starts smiling. He grabs his uniform. Am I official motorcycle officer now? Yes, you are, Chris. His wish had become true. Unfortunately, Chris passed away a few hours after that. We learned he was going to be buried in Illinois. Our commanders asked if I would go back and give Chris a full police funeral. As far as they were concerned, we had lost a fellow officer. Chris was buried in uniform. Great Marguerite's Chris Gracious, Arizona Trooper. We had so much We had so much press coverage, and I just kept thinking, flying home from Illinois back to Arizona. Here's this little boy, he had a wish and made it happen. But not only that, I watched his mother in this whole time. She just got tears in her eyes because she has her seven-year-old back. He forgot he was ill. He forgot about IVs and doctors and cancer and everything else. And that's when the idea was blown right there. Why can't we do that for other children? Let them make a wish and we're going to make it happen. Now, it took me six months to start the organization. And this is before the days of internet and everything else. You go to the library, you do research. And fortunately, I had an attorney who was a friend, and I know that's an oxymoron, and I apologize to <laughs> any attorneys in here. <laughs> they helped me put the whole thing together. But in, in uh, November of 1980, we became official. And since that time, because of this one little boy, the Make-A-Wish Foundation has grown to 63 chapters in the United States, 34 international chapters on five continents, we have granted over 350,000 wishes worldwide. And while we're here tonight, an average, a wish is granted every 26 minutes somewhere in the world. So we've been here since 6 o'clock. How many wishes have we granted? Quite a few, right? Again, all because of one little boy. Now, what's so important about Greg, what he said about Secret Knock, is about four years ago, I get a phone call from Greg. Calissa Bird is there. Calissa is the one that introduced me to Greg. And he said, I want you to come to San Diego. And I said, no, I don't know who you are. I'm still the police detective by then. I'm, I'm in now homicide when I say police. I don't know who this guy is. But I kind of did a little research, no wants and warrants. So, okay, I like San Diego. I'll go over there. This gentleman in that four years has changed my life. I've since retired with 44 years of service. But because of him, we've got a book going, we've got a movie going, he's introducing me to some great people like I'm here tonight, and it's all because of that secret knock event. So I'm promoting it also. I'm not promoting Make-A-Wish in general. There are so many great charities out there. And if you can, give back somehow. There's 1.2 million charities in the United States. You can research with charitynavigator.org, see which one flips your boat, flips your switch, whatever it is that you want to take care of, and give back a little bit. Help some people out, just like we did with Chris. And thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. How's that possible? I go, what is it? He goes, I would just want my story to be told. I want my grandkids to know what I did. So I says, you know what, Frank? No matter what, I'm going to make your story into a major motion picture. Sign right here. Give me your life rights, and I'm going to make this movie. Only challenge is, I've never made a movie. <laughs> right? But he trusted and did it. And today, today we are up here, and we had two meetings with people that have done Academy Award-winning films 
Both of them said that we are in and they want to be part of this movie. Put your hands together for his movie coming out to life called The American Hero. Right? So after we did Three Feet from Gold, after we did some of these projects, people kept saying, but how do you not quit? And so we decided to do this project called Stickability. It's called The Power to Persevere. And what we did is the first guy I interviewed, this guy named Marty Cooper. I see him on 60 Minutes. And I go, I gotta meet Marty. Two days later, I'm in his office and I'm taking his brain. I'm talking about what stickability means to him. Now, Marty Cooper invented something you might use every day. It's called a cellular phone. Where would your life be today without one, right? And I said, I go, Marty, what is stickability? What does that mean to you? And he said, stickability has to be parallel with another word called flexibility. He says, if you're not willing to adapt, if you're not willing to adjust, you'll end up being stuck. And he told a story about a spider monkey. He said, a spider monkey in the rainforest is the most quick, nimble creature. You cannot harpoon it, spear it, catch it, it's too wiry. But one hunter figured it out. He took a heavy log, drilled a tiny hole, and left it at the base of the jungle. He dropped the peanut inside the hole and walked away. The monkey would smell that nut. Come down, reach his hand in, grab a hold of the nut, and his fist becomes so big he can't pull it back out, become anchored to the log. The hunter comes by an hour later, captures the elusive spider monkey. Now, all he's got to do is let go, but he thinks that nut is nutrition. It's saving him. The question is, are you holding on to your own nut right now? <laughs> and it might be in the form of that one deal or a car or a house or fear or a job. And what we think is saving us, what we think is nutrition, could literally be leading to your own demise. Sometimes we have to have the courage to simply let go so we can live to fight another day. From there, I got this chance to sit down with amazing human beings, but one story sticks out. John Schwartz, the inventor of string theory. Here's what he said to me. He said, successful people seek counsel and failures listen to opinion. I'm gonna say it again. This is your biggest takeaway for the night. Successful people seek counsel where failures listen to opinion. What's the difference? Real simple. Opinion is based on ignorance, lack of knowledge, inexperience, like all your family friends who tell you you're crazy when you go do something special. Counsel is based on wisdom, knowledge, mentorship, people who've already paved the way. If you go to a family friend who never wrote a book and say, I'm going to write one, they're going to say, you can't do that. you got a D in English, right? Yeah. If I sit there and say, okay, well, that's your opinion. If I go to Mark Victor Hansen wrote Chicken Soup and sold 100 million copies, they'll say, great, before you get started, here's what you need to know and give you counsel based on wisdom, knowledge, mentorship. John Short said, when we start spending our daily activities only seeking counsel and ignoring people's opinion, that's the day your life will change. By the way, August 10, 11, 12 in San Diego, California is going to be the next secret knock. Look, we don't have one of these things, limited amount. All we do is we save a block of tickets for you guys. And by the way, this is an expensive, expensive event. It's $3,000 to come. The only difference that we do of our events than anyone else, there's nothing sold. You cannot run in the back of the room with your credit card. Everything's covered. You're going to leave with more than you come from. But the whole idea is this. If you've ever said to yourself, how do I change my circle? How is it that I'm the smartest person in my circle? How is it that I reach out and surround myself with the people that are truly getting the results you want? That's what we created this activity for. The next one won't be till 2016, and late or mid 2016, we're thinking about doing one right here in this room. What do you guys think of that? Idea? So the next one's gonna be August 10, 11, 12, and you can see my lovely wife right over here, Miss Vanna White. There it is, at my wife Alan. Lovely, lovely. By the way, my wife just made Mrs. San Diego. Pretty cool, right? A few years ago, we went to Africa and we climbed and summited Mount Kilimanjaro. Alan is the first Filipino woman in the history of the world to actually climb and summit Mount Kilimanjaro. Pretty cool, right? Eh? And you know how we did it? I did not ask some surfer kid how to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. I found the Sherpa that had climbed it four, five, six hundred times, and that's who I hired. Wherever they put their boot print, I put my boot print because I knew they'd make it to the top. 
Surround yourself with people who are getting the results you want and all things are possible. Theo Davies is in the back. He's our writer and director, by the way, of the American Hero movie. This guy, if you're gonna watch your eye, the up and coming superstar, that tall, lanky guy from uh, United Kingdom, look out for him, right there, there you go, that's the guy. Hey. And the whole idea is surround yourself with people who are doing what you want to do and you can do it too. And the final food for thought is this, the most successful people are also the most available. It's weird, I know. The most successful people are also the most available. If you're brand new at something, you're happy-go-lucky, you're cool. If you're at the top of your field, you're happy-go-lucky, you've got nothing to prove. If you're in the middle, pain in the ass. <laughs> you're filled with ego, you're edging God out, you're finding your own voice. So the secret, when you were a kid, they said, don't cut to the front of the line as an adult, Cut to the front of the line. Yeah. Surround yourself with people who are doing what you want to do. It'll be amazing what you can do. And out of all the interviews, people always ask me, you know, what's my favorite one? It's like picking your favorite child, but here it is. It came from a philosopher. It came from a poet, a wordsmith named Evander Holyfield. You know that boxing dude? He won more heavyweight championships than anyone. And I asked him, I go, how in the world did you do it? And he said, I have a higher standard. I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, if you have a car and you won't tolerate it running bad or being dirty, you have a higher standard in a nicer car than your neighbor. In sports, I showed up early, left late, invented exercises. I had a higher standard and I won more championships than anyone. He goes, where could you be outside the ring if you were a pet groomer, stockbroker, or insurance sales executive and had a higher standard? I go, didn't it hurt being in a fight? He goes, yeah, it hurts. But when you're in a fight, you don't focus on the pain. You don't focus on the blows. As soon as you focus on the pain, you end up on your back, knocked out. But that's what people do outside the ring. They focus on gas prices, war, economy, and they wonder why they never become a champion. And he pulled me in tight. This Adonis of a man missing half a year of bitten off by Tyson, right? He says, you know what the funny thing is? He says, when you do win the championship, he says, everyone comes to their feet and they chant your name. They raise your hand in victory and the guy puts a big shiny belt around your waist. And at that moment, and at that second, you don't feel even one of the punches you took along the journey. But the guy in the losing locker room will feel every bruise and have every excuse for the rest of their life wishing they had a higher standard. Now look, I don't know this about you because I don't know everyone in this room, but I do know this. For years, you are the person that everyone comes to for counsel. You are the smartest person in your group. And for years, you've been taking care of your family and your friends and your peers and your coworkers. And it's time to start getting selfish. Like Les Brown says, we got to fill our own cup so full that we can feed the world with what flows over. Stop giving from an empty cup. You get selfish and you draw a line in the sand and say, it's my turn. For years I've been watching other people, not as smart as me, have more success. That day ends today. You draw a line in the sand and say, what I've gone through in life has given me a PhD in what works and what does not. I'm gonna start implementing it today. You are a reflection of the people you hang around the most. Our income, attitude, and lifestyle is the average of that group. When you're ready to change that group, we've given you a way out. We've given you an opportunity to come to Secret Knot. The realities are you are special and you are great. You got something so special inside of you, you don't even know what it is. Know why? Because you've been taking care of everyone else's needs, waiting for the perfect time until it's yours. And that time is now. You draw a line on the sand and say, you know what? It is my turn. You're gonna start investing in yourself so you can have the resources and the results that you're destined for. Someone in this room has got the idea for the next play, the next book, the next entrepreneurial spirit. Don't take it to your grave. Do something with it. Share it with the world. you got something special. You draw a line in the sand and you say, it is my turn. I deserve it. I'm going to grab that brass ring because I know I'm destined for something special. And when you want to say die and throw in the towel, that's when you kick it in the most. Just like Napoleon Hill. He said our greatest success comes one step beyond your greatest setback. So when you want to fail, when you want to say I'm done, when you say I'm tired, that's when you go the most. You literally could be. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for having me tonight. Good night, man. Good night.
mediocrity. That we are to live our lives accordingly, striving to be agents of change as we attempt to leave this world a better place than we found it.